Welcome to our live web event. My name is Grover Reiter. Today's topic is Be Prepared AI and Cybersecurity. There's a lot of interest in this topic. A large number of people responded. So the first thing is, what are we gonna to do today? We got two main speakers and we'll introduce them as we go along functionally. We've got Bo Hetzker and Dmitry Dontov. Uh, first of all, Bo is gonna dig into uh, kind of the, the big picture of AI, what AI is, what it's not, uh, how it's being used and, and then misused, of course, uh, in cybersecurity. And then we're going to switch topics a little bit, and Dimitri's going to dig into basically a, a day in the life of, uh, of having AI-based cybersecurity. And if, you're in, if you need some of it, how do you evaluate a vendor? And we'll do this kind of from a first-person uh, evaluation. Uh, we're going to look at uh, whether you can trust the AI you're being presented with by those uh, nice-looking marketing people, and then how we evaluate the performance of AI. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Bo. Bo is a Bay Area cybersecurity veteran. He's got 40 years of experience. Uh, he can talk very knowledgeably about the earlier days of expert systems, uh, the path that AI has taken. He knows a lot about this topic. Um, and I'm going to uh, let him dig into this because he's one of the people, the few people actually, who has been living at the intersection between both AI and security for a long time. Bo, over to you. Thank you, Grover. I appreciate the intro. And of course, I'm starting with the perspective that we are more likely to have some cybersecurity expertise than AI expertise. So I want to start off by asking the question, what is AI? Um, a WAG once said that AI was anything a human can do that a computer can't do. Uh, that is obviously a bit facetious, but it's interesting to note that many tasks that were once deemed to be AI are just now considered routine processing. For example, OCR has been a staple for close to 40 years. Um, more recently, we have things like biometrics, um, wherein fingerprint readers or retina readers or the like are used as a second factor for authentication. Uh, these were at one time tagged as AI. Now we just take them for granted. Um, there is, in fact, a more formal definition. We could say that AI is a computer program designed to solve difficult problems which humans routinely solve. The goal of AI is to develop programs which can solve such problems independently. So we now have a very high level definition, but you know, AI, of like every major field of study, has its um, variations. And, and we're going to go through a few of those. The, the one that we will make the most focus on will be, of course, neural networks. But of course, there are other topics um, and other strategies. We have, for example, uh, expert systems, case systems, where there's obviously machine vision, robotics, natural language processing, all of which contribute, and they're not mutually exclusive. They, you know, more than one algorithm is frequently required to do a problem. That having been said, Neural networks are really dominating um, AI today. That has been driven by a combination of factors. One, the type of problems we're asking AI to solve are in many cases well adapted for neural networks. Um, for example, image processing, where we can have, uh, with a sufficiently large body of uh, images, we can train to get very high accuracy uh, for imaging. Um, neural networks themselves are loosely derived from the brain, but one should not be confused. The algorithms used are not uh, consistent with the way the brain works. We don't really understand how the brain works, but um, it has been inspirational to uh, utilize some of those uh, concepts, such as feed forward as well as feed backwards uh, networks. Given that, we then will progress to talking about machine learning. And machine learning is a subset of neural networks. Uh, and machine learning itself uh, incorporates the study of algorithms and use of statistical models to do specific tasks. Now, having said that, what exactly is not AI? If you believe the marketing people, AI fairy dust is sprinkled on everything. Um, specifically, um, there are marketeers out there who will claim that because they use statistical techniques, 
this somehow makes an application an AI application. Uh, never mind the fact that most of the statistical techniques used are anywhere from 80 to 100 years old, uh, predating the computer itself. The, the second element that gets thrown out as allegedly AI is big data. If we have enough data there, then it must be AI. Well, a lot of data is just a lot of data. Some statistical methods are well disposed to analyze data, for example, trying to find correlations in big data that otherwise it simply the volume will make it impossible. That having been said, that by itself does not constitute AI. The combination of statistical methods and big data may well be used in an AI setting to drive um, correlations and hopefully uh, sound conclusions, if not causation, from that data set and hopefully in time to be of use. So having said that, um, let's talk about yet another problem. So now that we have AI here, um, or at least arriving very soon, you know, how do we use it and how do we avoid abusing it or having it abuse us as the case may be? For example, if we have uh, AI being used in, to track potential uh, criminals and used, for instance, in sentencing, it's pretty awkward if the algorithm itself actually creates the problem that it's trying to solve. That would be unfortunate. The hyping and overselling of AI and its uh, subsequent funding by Silicon Valley leads us to a really difficult place, which is to say, that without transparency, um, without the ability to know what training sets are being used, um, without any notion of the algorithms involved, we don't have a good model. Um, let's talk about what good uses we have, and specifically in cybersecurity. Because cybersecurity has the problem that as our tools get better, the data volumes increase, and the difficulty of spotting the um, events that are security significant becomes more and more difficult. AI is a great help here because it can pick out correlations and patterns um, that indicate potential abuse. Now, when I say pick out patterns here, we're, we're talking about a couple of different uh, potential items. We may, for instance, be talking about looking at uh, threat intelligence, you know, what are the bad guys doing out there? And is there something in my system that looks like something that was exploited in somebody else's system? That's one possibility. Another is user behavioral analytics, UVA, where we're looking at anomalies in behavior. Um, to, to give an example of that, if we know that somebody works in engineering and we see that all of a sudden they're attempting to access files that belong to accounting, that ought to raise a questionnaire. That, the problem with this sort of thing is that data is buried. We might generate in our typical SIM system, uh, and remember SIM is only a subset of all the log data, but if we're just looking at the SIM data, we might generate a terabyte of data per day. And many of the regimes uh, out there that we subscribe to, PCI for example, requires us to keep that data around for at least 90 days. Some require as much as a year. Great, now I've got a petabyte of data, what the heck do I do with it, and how am I gonna find that guy uh, you know, who's a low volume user trying to uh, commit unauthorized access. So AI can help us a lot with this problem. The way to think about AI in general is not as it's gonna be smarter than we are and you can retire to all those people in your sock. Instead, it's a very helpful tool. The analogy here is like um, using, for instance, machine translation. We've all had fun with Google Translate and seen some of the, the garish and bizarre results of it. But applications where the machine translation is used as a tool for a translator have accelerated translation by tenfold. That's the kind of model that we're looking at for AI in cybersecurity. Can I make my analysts, my threat hunters more effective, more efficient, and able to draw conclusions better? Um, finding the threats that are emerging, as well as the threats that are already present. So anomaly detection is a huge area where we can look for not merely 
you know, bad perpetrators, but systems that have gone awry. Typically, when we're training uh, new AI-based applications, we expose it to a set of behaviors, and then we try to tell it which behaviors are good and bad. And Dimitri will have more to say about this when he talks about the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. So we see this application and others like it as being an adjunct to intelligence that allows us to uh, respond to threats faster, better, and hopefully cheaper. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't say that the bad guys aren't any stupider than we are. They use AI too. So we're seeing where AI is using, uh, being used by attackers, for example, to try to simulate an average user. In other words, they want to hide in the noise. That can be uh, obviously a big challenge for us. Um, so with this in mind, we, you know, we have to stay current and try to recognize that AI is going to loom as a bigger and bigger uh, potential uh, tool for our arsenal. It is not the only tool. It is not um, decisive by itself, but as it, the techniques get better and better, we will inject it into everyday applications and then it will become as routine as biometrics and OCR. So with that, let me turn it back to you, Gruber. Thank you very much. And now we're going to hear from Dimitri. Dimitri is a uh, is a CEO and founder of Spin Technology. That's a leading cloud data protection company in uh, Palo Alto. He's been doing this for more than 20 years. Uh, he's an expert in the intersection between all the security discussions, the AI discussions, and then how to implement that into a variety of cloud services and other applications. Uh, he's done a lot in the high-tech space, and I think as he starts digging into this, you'll see uh, Dimitri's got, uh, you know, a practicality to him. He's, he wants things to work. Uh, and so he wants to take the complexity of AI, uh, the needs of cybersecurity, and turn this into something that's actually going to have a practical application. So, Dimitri, over to you. Thanks, Grover. Appreciate inviting me here. And uh, I think Bo did a great job explaining what is AI and what AI is not. And uh, to continue this conversation, I would like to share some of uh, my thoughts on uh, the evaluation process when it comes to evaluating an AI-based cybersecurity vendor or AI-based solution. And, you know, we speak with many customers, and I think it's a great case for uh, uh, DevOps teams, for security teams and administrators who uh, have to evaluate new products, new security solutions from time to time. And what we learned, and based on our experience, I created a list of questions that can help these teams to evaluate uh, AI-based security product without having a deep AI expertise. So I created an, uh, about eight, eight questions that you probably can ask any cybersecurity vendor. Uh, so let's get started. And the first question, uh, what many of our customers like to say, ask our company is they try to identify AI approach in our company. And what they usually like to ask, uh, you can, Turn the slide. Yeah. So, what business goal uh, do you guys try to achieve, and what problem do you try to uh, solve with the help of AI? So, uh, and what we usually try to answer is that there are free solutions in our company, security solution, uh, when we where we use AI technology. So, the first solution is ransomware protection for G Suite and Office 365 customers. And we protect organizations against, uh, against ransomware attack. And this solution can detect ransomware attack in the cloud. It can identify a source of attack. And it can st stop and block the source. So uh, we can help organizations to significantly decrease downtime when an organization uh, was hit by ransomware. And this is our business goal. And we use AI to fight with false positive. And this is the problem we try to solve. And the solution number two is application risk assessment. 
And here we uh, analyze all the applications that have access to your G Suite or Office 365 environment. And we provide you risk assessment for business risk, security risk, and compliance risk. So uh, as a result, we provide the overall security score and we use AI to improve the accuracy of the security score. So the business goal is to provide the quality solution that helps admins to simplify G Suite or Office 365 experience and um, help administrators to save a tremendous amount of time evaluating this solution and make the right decision. Either this particular app should be blacklisted or whitelisted. And again, our, our problem we try to solve is to improve the accuracy of scoring. And the solution number three, we do insider threats monitoring. <clears throat> so we protect organizations against data leak. And here we fight with uh, such uh, incidents like abnormal data download from cloud to local device, abnormal data transfer from uh, cloud or business cloud account to personal cloud and abnormal data sharing. And again, in this particular case, we fight false positive because we don't want to um, provide wrong result to our customers. And they, these are three uh, business goals we try to achieve and these are three problems we try to solve. So uh, the next question uh, our customers like to ask us, they want to identify uh, do we really have a true AI solution or is it just a great sales pitch from a smart sales engineer, right? And uh, they like to ask two questions, actually. First question is a really interesting one because they want to ask us, what type of AI do you guys use? And they ask, uh, is it general AI or is it specific AI? Some people may call it uh, focused AI. And the definition of uh, general AI is that this is a new generation of AI system that can um, acquire uh, new knowledge, new skills, uh, fully autonomously and interactively, and it can um, proactively use existing knowledge and existing skills uh and it can uh to accelerate the learning and it can use multiple platform so basically the official status of general ai is currently in progress and uh there is no successful cases on the market that implemented a successful general ai so when a vendor pitch you general ai that can be considered as a red flag so what we do here in spin we use specific ai and specific AI is uh, task-based AI designed for specific task only. So you uh, use algorithm for different one algorithm for a different problem. And this is what we do here at SPIN. So another great question they like to ask is what kind of machine learning are you doing? And what uh, when you uh, speak with different vendors, one vendor can say that we do this one or that one or we do supervised learning and you know what we learned um, on uh, based on our experience when you use uh, a single algorithm to replicate uh, a certain amount of human steps and tasks that it's actually not enough and the single algorithm it doesn't actually uh, do a job so for example if you use an algorithm to improve your detection um, this is just a better detection. That's not an AI. And what we learn in, in this industry when we speak about true AI system, it should be a combination of different AIs like supervised AI uh, learning or uh, unsupervised for different types of cases that can cover different types of cases and that can replicate as many human steps as possible. So uh, what we try to build here at SPIN, we try to build an ecosystem of different AIs for different cases. For example, I want to know who administers the system and I want to know who um, is the company HIPAA compliant. And in that case, what kind of security policy should be implemented, right? 
or I want to know uh, what geolocation was used to get access to my data. So um, once again, when you build an ecosystem of different AI, this is what we call a true AI system. So if, uh, and yeah, another great question is you, you, you can ask your vendor um, a number of uh, outcomes. So how many uh, human tasks are you replicating? And again, if you use <clears throat> different ty type of AI to cover a lot of cases, then you can replicate a lot of uh, human tasks and that's the value of AI system. So basically, if uh, you are satisfied with these two questions, uh, it makes sense to move forward and uh, find out more about performance. But if you are not satisfied with the, this question, we wouldn't recommend to waste your time on other questions. So let's move forward and discuss some performance metrics. Another great question that our customers like to ask us, how do you train your models? And this is a great question actually. So uh, there are actually a few ways that some companies like to train models on real data, some companies like to train models on fake data. And what we do here at SPIN, we train our data on uh, our models on real data. And real data means it's a live environment that today has over 4,000 organizations and one and a half million users. And we have a database of uh, over 60,000 applications and Chrome extensions, plus we store over three petabytes of users' data and all storages. So as you can imagine, we have a lot of uh, real data, and this is what uh, makes our uh, AI system valuable. So we recommend to uh, choose a cybersecurity vendor who train their models on real data uh, versus fake data, because fake data cannot cover all the cases you're looking for. So uh, next good, good question that our customers like to ask us, um, how does a learning period uh, take for your algorithms? And you know, uh, for example, in our case, back to spin, uh, some algorithm can start generating first result within the next few minutes, and some, uh, it takes them a few days. And this is actually a normal situation. Uh, on the market depends on, on the task. Uh, another good question that you want to ask is what does the AI pro development process look like in your organization? And for example, again, based on our experience in our company, what we do, we use a combination of security expert and data scientist. And data scientists shouldn't be a real security expert actually. Uh, data science, it should be enough to have a person with highly developed mathematical skills. And the job of data uh, security expert is to research more on new security threats. And the job of data scientist is to constantly tune the models, uh, watch on data and improve algorithms. Uh, so I think the combination of these two people in the company makes a lot of sense. Uh, another great question uh, I would ask is that uh, related to metrics. And you know, there are many metrics, uh, a lot of metrics in uh, AI that you may want to ask. But the basic one is uh, metrics like false positive, false negative, uh, positive prediction value, negative prediction value, and accuracy. Uh, so you want to ask this as well just to get a uh, brief overview of the solution. And I think there may be one more question I forgot to ask. Uh, yeah, this one. So uh, this is a great question, actually. Uh, do you engage your customer in the process? And we believe that this is one of the crucial part of any AI system, because if you don't engage your customer in this process, you never know uh, is your, are your customers happy or not? And you have to provide an interface in your product that can uh, allow your customers communicate with you and provide some feedback. And if they can see uh, 
uh, false positive, for example, they have to be able to report it to you. <clears throat> then you add your security expert and this guy is going to review it. And if the company agrees, for example, in our case, when we agree, we adjust uh, security scoring for our application risk assessment. If we disagree, we don't do anything, but it helps a lot. And the last question I would ask is that, um, for how do you avoid data pollution? And this is also a good question because the more data you have, uh, the more you have worry about data pollution. And again, also if you use different types of sources uh, that help you to collect data, then you have to worry about this. And in this case, our solution is that we also involve our security expert, we involve our uh, data scientists so they can watch on data, clean up the data if needed, and that's how we uh, avoid this case. So Grover, I think these eight questions uh, should be enough to ask any uh, cybersecurity vendor when you evaluate an AI solution. And I hope this information was helpful. So uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Dimitri, and thank you, Bo. So this was great so far. We do have questions coming in. Uh, there's a little bit of a pattern to the questions. The first thing is, is Dimitri, you said uh, that you have to distinguish between true and fake AI, uh, and several people wanted to know, uh, given Bo's more general background on this, Bo, what's your take on fake AI? Fake AI? Is that actually a, an issue we should care about? Well, at the end of the day, we're looking for a solution to a problem. Um, the challenge. It, you know, Dimitri was very helpful in that he outlined specific criteria for selecting a solution. Um, the concern about real versus fake AI is that, you know, it's not that fake AI is somehow wrong. It's simply been oversold. And it may or may not actually be an application that solves our problem. So in reality, it's a gradual transition. It's not this sudden leap upward. Um, you can use statistical methods, for example, to do predictive analysis, and you don't have to call it AI. You just say, we use statistics to predict that these events are occurring. Um, so I don't believe the issue is so much about fake uh, AI as it is about the hyping of an application simply by saying, we use AI, we use machine learning, you know, we use a training set, so therefore, you know, we're better than everybody else. That's the, the hype that we want to avoid. Okay, thank you. Um, Dimitri, you mentioned in your metrics uh, false negatives. Uh, obviously, people care about false positives because then they waste time on them and it could cause them to uh, overwork. But false negatives, what's the right target for false negatives? Is it is it zero? What can we expect out of these AI-driven systems uh, for, for a rate of false negatives? Uh, yeah, this is a great question, Grover. So uh, false negative and false positive, when you speak about you want to find out false negative metric i think uh, you're looking something uh, below one percent and when you talk about false positive you know everything uh below five percent is not a good solution and uh more than five percent is is a good is a good solution and if for example we're talking about accuracy i think everything above 95 percent accuracy is a good solution so that However, I might add to that, that for each uh, situation, we want to look at the cost of a false negative versus the right. cost of a false positive. There is a yeah. minima that can be achieved because these are intention. The more you try to eliminate false negatives, the higher you increase false positives. So at some point, you're going to say, I don't need many false positives because I can't handle them. On the other hand, they cost for a, a single false negative far exceeds that of a single false positive because that false negative means that you are accepting as harmless an event that's actually causing you harm. So given that model, we have to find the balance that minimizes the overall organizational cost, you know, including reputational cost as well as direct costs before we simply say, yeah, we're going to tolerate a certain level of false negatives. That makes sense, and I think that's actually that's what I actually heard with Dimitri's answer, which is he he thinks that systems need to be kind of tuned to the point where you may have you know as many as five times as many false positives 
because you don't want the false negatives to you know to get through at all. Uh, but if but if the false positives get too big, like you said, you know you're spending all day uh, ch chasing whack-a-mole on things that didn't actually even happen. So it, that's it, why you need to tune this constantly. This is ongoing process that will never stop. Correct. It's a learning. It's it, that is training never stops. The training of these systems never stop because the people who are attacking are inventing. Uh, including, as Bo pointed out, using the same tools we're using to find them. Um, Bo, uh, one of the things that came up was this general versus specific AI. Uh, can you dig into uh, general? It sounds like general is a good thing. Why Why don't we want general AI to be uh, driving our cybersecurity? It's got well, a nice it's word. Interesting. The history of, of AI started with the assumption that we could create general problem solving. In fact, uh, generalized problem solving GPS was the first GPS acronym before uh, that satellite system that you know leads our cars around. And the assumption was if we had enough logic, we didn't need very much data. So logic alone could tell us, for example, how to recognize shapes or you know how to analyze speech. It turned out that there were very few successes. And so, you know, the, the, we left the generalized problem solving era in the 1970s. And what we have seen is that there was a steady, if somewhat slow, attention to specific AI algorithms. The real breakthrough and the thing that has made AI take off and explode has been the combination of neural network uh, technology, large data sets, and incredible computing power. In other words, when you go to, um, let's say, a Google Cloud Platform, you can actually use 100,000 CPU cores on your AI problem and do analyses that are would be inconceivable even 10 years ago. And now those compute cycles are cheap, and they're going to get cheaper and cheaper as time goes on. So that combination plus the uh, attention paid to all the different variations of neural networks has created opportunities. So now we see that data-driven uh, AI is proving to be more and more applicable, more effective, and easier to build than any generalized uh, problem solver. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, Dimitri, you mentioned scoring a couple of times. Uh, and I got a couple of people saying, uh, can you tell us what you're actually scoring and why it's important? So what is it that that you're using AI to actually score? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so our application risk assessment provide you uh, application scoring uh, just, so what we do here, we analyze every single app that has access to your G Suite environment that has access to your sensitive data for uh, business risk, for compliance risk, and for security risk. And based on these criteria, we create uh, overall security score for every single app. Uh, and actually this score has over 20 criteria. Uh, and uh, the benefit of using this scoring model is that it helps administrators to make the right decision uh, to blacklist this app or whitelist it. So, uh, yeah, that's how our scoring model works. Okay, and, and so I guess this this brings on the question. So what you're saying is you're scoring apps that are actually in things like the Google Marketplace or the uh, Microsoft ecosystem marketplace. Is that correct? So today we score non-marketplace apps. We score uh, Google Marketplace apps, and we can score uh, Chrome extensions. Okay, and and so you, what you're saying is is that those just because they're in the marketplace doesn't mean they're inherently safe. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, that's you're totally correct. Okay. I think there are a lot of uh, G Suite administrators who've had to find that out the hard way. Oh, well, yeah. You know, uh, again, based on our experience, when we talk with some customers, we realize that some organizations have over 6,000 Chrome extensions, and there is no actually uh, great solution to uh, manage access for these uh, extensions and uh, existing providers they allow you either block it or 
uh, get access to everyone and there is no flexible solution that can provide you flexibility to choose well, what app should be blacklisted and what which one should be uh, whitelisted and this is this the gap we uh, try to solve with our solution okay thank you I have one more question which uh, I'll answer myself and then let Dimitri and Bo pitch in on it uh, it's a question which is uh, which algorithm type or methodology does, do our business cases lend themselves to in a specific question around regression or classification or some combination? I think Dimitri did a really good job of describing uh, there is no one tool, you use a combination. And I think that we primarily use regression to find baseline patterns, but then we have to use smart moving forward classification to actually detect an anomaly. So regression is primarily where we develop our baselines and classification is primarily where we have a trigger. And remember that cybersecurity has the same problem with weather. Uh, you know, Bo talked about, you know, what, what WAG said with uh, if, a, if, a, if a machine can't do it, it's AI. Um, you know, it, it's, and this is, this is part of the, the weather argument, which is in a perfect world, we could de depict what exactly the weather is going to be like the tr trouble is, is that we need three weeks to tell you what it's going to be like tomorrow. So what we have to do is converge using classification uh, fuzzy logic that actually tells us this is above or below the threshold of a risk. And we use baselining from regression analysis of history to tell us whether or not the event is close enough to examine or just to pass on. So I'll let uh, Dimitri, you want to dig into that anymore about the different kinds of methods we use? or just because uh, you did a good job covering the fact that we have family, supervised and unsupervised. You want to add anything else to that? Yeah, sure. I, again, I can share our experience based uh, what we do in our company at SPIN. And for example, for example, back to the solution we do uh, for, for, for risk scoring, we, we use supervised model, supervised learning with uh, regression analysis. We use uh, random forest as an algorithm. And for other two solutions, we use uh, unsupervised uh, learning with clustering. And this uh, algorithm works pretty well so far, but again, this, this doesn't mean that we will not reconsider it in the future because uh, we, have, we can see probably new types of attack and we need to tune our models. So that doesn't mean that that's the law and we will never change it. Does it make any it, it does. It does. And uh, for those of you who haven't dealt with a lot of these, um, uh, you know, models of, of as Dimitri called it, uh, clustering, um, one of the things you have to deal with is, is sensitivity to outliers uh, because some outliers are indications of, you know, gross attack and some outliers occur in nature. Um, and so that's where, you know, it does take AI and you have to look at a million events. Bo, do you want to pitch on anything on this about what you think about the intersection of, of methods, specific methods in the cybersecurity space? Well, something that we all learned in basic statistics 101 was that correlation does not equal causation. And the practical significance of this is because we can find a um, correlation in a large data set does not automatically mean that just because A associates with B, that A causes B. So we can create a lot of red herrings for ourselves if we aren't applying some logic to say, you know, really what is causing this? Uh, as a result, a lot of AI techniques now have to work on solving the causality problem so that we are uh, not just reacting to a spurious correlation. Because in any large data set, just by randomness alone, you will have correlations that have absolutely no meaning whatsoever. So we have to find various tests to eliminate those, as well as to using common sense. This is where you know, a certain level of supervision comes in, uses common sense that says, yeah, it makes more sense for um, this system to be sending traffic to that system than the other way around. For example, Dimitri mentioned about uh, unusual downloads. This is a classic example. If you're just looking at correlation, you don't even know which way the data is going. Um, whereas, you know, clearly data that's exiting the cloud and going to a personal machine, we know the difference between the cloud and the machine. And we can say, 
this doesn't seem right. This is a human intelligence fused with the AI that detects the pattern in the first place. So we always have to be mindful that AI is not magic. It relies on uh, a certain amount of human discretion and intuition to complement it. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this point, we have a couple more questions that are very environment specific, and we will get back to those people individually. We have your question. We know uh, your email. We can respond to you directly. Uh, I think this has been a great session. I mean, I've, I've learned a lot from both the reviews before this and even in this session today. Uh, Bo, thank you very much. And Dimitri, thank you very much. This has been excellent. Thank you, Grower. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. So. so if you if you want some more information, you can go to spin.ai uh, and look at a practical solution that uses AI to uh, solve some cybersecurity issues. Um, if you have any other questions, you can also reach out to us. You can just respond to the email that you got for this event. We can get back to you. Uh, thank you very much for attending. This event has been recorded and we'll send everybody a copy of the recording after the fact. Thank you for your attendance. We'll end this session now. Gentlemen, have a great day.